Okay, so are there any questions before we start today? So remember that you do have a quiz next Monday, which is going to be over the lymphatic system and then what we get to today in the immune system. And the lymphatic and the immune system are actually in one chapter in the new textbook, but in the older textbooks, it's actually two separate chapters. So this is an example of possible, a possible quiz question that could appear on a quiz or actually on the midterm or final. And so what do you think is the correct answer to this question? Lymph nodes, right? So remember that we have this system of lymphatic vessels that it goes throughout the body and is associated with capillaries and it picks up that extra fluid that's lost at the capillaries and then transports it back towards the heart, the neck region. And as it goes through, it goes through these little um, nodes, which are little capsules that are made of reticular connective tissue and have white blood cells in them. And some of those lymph nodes are really deep in the body, but others are palpable. So remember we talked about how you can feel the lymph nodes in your cervical region, also in your armpits, which is called the axillary region, and then in the groin, uh, area or the inguinal region. And that's just because those are close to the surface. And so if those feel swollen or painful, that is a sign that you have a possible infection. The other structures, the spleen and the tonsils and the pyres patches do not directly filter lymph, but they have other functions in the lymphatic system. And then the liver is actually part of a digestive system organ and we're going to talk about that when we get to the digestive system. Okay. So there, are there any questions about that? Nope. Okay. So today we're going to start talking about the immune system. And actually, this is one of my favorite topics because I think it is super interesting. Um, when we talk about the immune system, we have to realize that we are multicellular organisms. So we have all of these cells in our bodies that have to cooperate with one another in order to protect us from infection because there's other types of organisms, specifically microorganisms that would like to feed upon us, right? So we are nutrients in our body. And so some of those um, can, can take up residence in the body and actually cause damage as they feed upon us. We also have to realize that the immune system is really important in protecting us from renegade cells. So if you think about our bodies, all of our cells have to cooperate, but sometimes those cells become cancerous, for example, and then they start to do their own thing. So they start to take up nutrients and invade tissues and kind of, uh, kind of crowd out normal healthy tissue. So when, I talk about the, when you talk about the immune system, it's got to do a couple of things. So it's got to detect self from non-self. And so if you remember in cell biology, we talked about the plasma membrane of cells and embedded in those plasma membranes are proteins. And so our cells have proteins on their surface that allow our, us to detect whether or not those proteins are ours, our self proteins, or whether they are foreign proteins, okay? So proteins on the surface of cells. can be used for recognition. And so this is why, for example, if you get red blood cells transfused into your body that are of the wrong type, so if you're type A and you get a transfusion of type B, this is why your immune system will detect those red blood cells as being foreign and will cause those red blood cells to agglutinate and then could possibly lead to a transfusion reaction that could be lethal. It's also why you cannot um, get an organ from another person without taking drugs that dampen the immune response. So if you get a tissue transplant or an organ transplant, generally you have to be on immunosuppressant drugs 
for the rest of your life because you need to suppress your immune system from attacking that foreign organ. So all of our cell, all of our proteins are unique. If you are identical twins, obviously your proteins are almost, almost identical to um, the proteins that would be on your twin. But for the rest of us who do not have an identical twin, there's really nobody that has the exact same proteins. And this is why there is kind of an emphasis to use a person's own stem cells to grow new tissue, to grow new organs. Because if I take my stem cells out of my body and I'm able to grow new skin, when you transplant that skin onto me, then I am, my immune system is not going to detect it as being foreign, right? So our immune system is really good at detecting self from non-self. And so those proteins um, are actually referred to as antigens. So proteins are called antigens. And we'll talk more about what, what those antigens mean. It actually means antibody generators. And so these antigens that we have on the outside of our surface could be self antigens or they could be non self antigens. So they could be foreign. The second thing that the immune system must be able to do is it must be able to detect cancerous cells. So one of the really interesting things about cancer is, is that it arises quite frequently in people. So I can say with fairly certain uh, terms that we have all in this room had cancerous cells come up in our bodies. But if we have a strong immune system, it is going to fight off that cancer before it becomes a problem. So when people get older, their immune system actually starts to get weaker. And so that's probably why um, cancer is more common in older individuals than in younger individuals. And then in people that have a suppressed immune system, um, specifically like with AIDS, they also have a higher incidence of, of cancer. So the immune system must detect and destroy renegade cancerous cells, so cancer cells that have, these are self cells that have become a danger to the body, right? and cells that have been infected with a virus. So viruses are really interesting because they can actually hide out inside of our cells. So they can get right into this inside of the cells. And so you might have heard of people having um, had chicken pox um, as children and then the chickenpox virus actually hides out in the nerve cells, specifically in the nerve cells in the back of the body. And so when your immune system starts to get troubled, like when you get stressed out, what is the, the uh, thing that happens to people that have um, their virus, their chickenpox virus come back? Shingles, shingles right? So shingles um, is just those hidden viruses that come back out. So anything that can get inside of the cells and it's not just viruses, so I probably should put and other infectious structures, right? So, and I'll put other parasites. So we have um, microorganisms that, for example, cause malaria. And malaria um, is due to a parasite that gets inside of the red blood cells. And our body is not able to detect it because it's hidden. Right? So they hide out. Um, they're parasites that live inside of our cells, so they hide out. So we're going to talk about how um, cancer cells and cells that have been infected become a little bit different. They might have different proteins on their surface so that our immune system can fight those, find them, and fight them off. Okay? So those are the two things, the two major things that our immune system must do for us in order to be successful. So we're going to talk about what is referred to as innate defenses. And so when you think about that word, that means like you are born with it, right? It's like genetically programmed. And so what this means is, is that it is not dependent upon exposure or experience with the pathogen. 
What did you say before? You're born with it. You're how? born with it. So it's not a dependent upon experience. So when we look at organisms besides vertebrates, like invertebrates, and actually um, they've done a lot of studies on um, echinoderms like sea stars or sea urchins. They look at their immune system. We see that the innate immune system is more ancestral. It's more ancient, right? So invertebrates just have an innate defenses. They do not have the adaptive defenses that we do. And so we can kind of see how the immune system has become more complicated and more specific as we go from invertebrates to vertebrates, okay? So these innate defenses um, would include barriers to infection. Right? So probably the best way to protect ourselves is to prevent something from getting inside of us, right? So we have obviously the skin, Right, which protects us. And nowadays, you know, we don't think too much if we get a cut in our hand or if we have a wound, right? Because we know that we can go to the doctor and get antibiotics. But prior to antibiotics, if you had a big gaping wound on your skin, you know, that was like, maybe you're gonna die from it, right? So we kind of take for granted that nowadays we can um, protect ourselves even if we damage our skin, but in the past that was not the case, right? So when we talk about the skin, we can also talk about sweat. So sweat itself is antimicrobial. So when we sweat, we, we have in our sweat enzymes called lysozymes. So these are enzymes that break down bacteria. This is actually also in the saliva. So I always joke that this is the reason why when you cut yourself, it goes right to your mouth, right? Because you're like sucking on your wounds, right? Because your, your uh, salivary, your saliva actually has antimicrobial properties. So that can be a good thing to protect against infection, right? So the other thing that it has is it has acids. So it tends to be acidic. And it actually depends upon what you eat. So sometimes you can take in a lot of acid producing foods and you'll actually get rid of the acid on by sweating. And sometimes if I eat like too many ter cherry tomatoes, my sweat will actually become so acidic, it'll become irritating, right? So then I know I have to lay off the cherry tomatoes. So this ac acidity is also a big, um, um, component of protecting ourselves against infection because if you think about it it is the reason why or good reason why our stomach is also acidic so the stomach is acidic also when we look at um, the uh, female reproductive tract the vagina tends to be acidic to prevent against infection so acidic environments help to protect against infection and then we also have antibodies And I'm going to put that these are part of the adaptive response. So we can actually produce antibodies in our sweat and secrete them in our sweat. These are chemicals that are specific to a pathogen and are actually not part of the innate defense, but they are actually still in the sweat. There are some skin creams that uh, kind of play off of this acid, they call them an acid mantle. Um, so the skin is, it has an acid mantle. And I think that there's some skin creams that you can buy or that you get prescription that also call themselves an acid mantle to help prevent in skin infections. So the skin is a big uh, barrier. So we also have mucus. 
And so when we look at what mucus is, mucus is actually a protein called mucin. And when it is released by cells and mixes water, mixes with water, the mucin becomes mucus. So mucus is defensive. So it can be really annoying when you're producing a lot of it because of an allergy or whatever, but actually it is protective. And so um, one place where this mucus is really important is in the digestive system. So what the mucus does is it captures microorganisms and in the digestive system, it also protects against the acid. So the mucus in the digestive system and the, and the acid also, it kind of protects the system from being broken down, from, from being damaged. Okay. We also have this in our respiratory system. <clears throat> So one of the interesting things is we know mucus is produced in our sinuses and it's produced like in the back of our throat, in our pharynx region, but it is also produced in our trachea. So when we breathe in air, it goes into this major um, conducting vessel that takes it down to the bronchi into the lungs. And so we have lots of mucus in there and the mucus is actually pre uh, uh, moved up by cilia. So the cilia actually move the mucus up and we cough it up. So we're constantly moving mucus up from our respiratory tract, our trachea. And in those people that smoke specifically lots, that they have what is referred to as a smoker's cough, that means that they actually cannot get all of the mucus up from their respiratory tract naturally. And so they actually have to force it out. So they force it out by coughing. So what is the um, genetically inherited disease where we produce too much mucus and it's too thick? A person would produce too thick of mucus and too much of it in their respiratory tract. Anybody know what the disease is? It's a genetically inherited disease. So children have it and then they tend to die of it young. Cystic fibrosis, yes. And so cystic fibrosis is where there's too much mucus. And if this mucus is so thick that it cannot be moved up and swallowed, right, then it starts to accumulate and it can actually um, be a source of bacterial infection like pneumonia. So pneumonia gets into the lungs and people can die of this at a young age, right? Smoker's cough means that the, the mucus cannot be moved. So when they're sleeping, for example, in a normal person, the mucus is kind of always moving up and we're swallowing it as we're sleeping. So if you've ever lived with a smoker, what they do is they get up in the morning. My brother lived with me for a while and he would cough and he would cough and I was like, oh, and he would be like, I'm coughing up a lung. And I'm like, yeah, I know you are. Right? And he, then you just spit it all out. And it was like all that mucus that accumulated overnight was coming up. Right. The good thing about smokers cough is, is that it will go away if they stop smoking, right? So if they stop, lay off the smoking, then they tend to develop the cilia that will move the mucus naturally out, okay? So mucus is a really important component of, um, of that um, defense mechanism, okay? So acid and mucus, two examples of innate, also barriers, right, the, the skin as a barrier. Okay, so this is a diagram that shows some of the other defenses that our respiratory system has. So when we breathe things in, they always say in yoga class, for example, try to breathe through your nose. And the reason why they want you to breathe through your nose is, is that that is actually your natural filtration system. And it's kind of odd to me because whenever I am in a really dusty, dirty environment, I actually kind of avoid breathing through my nose and actually breathe through my mouth, which is probably the worst thing you can do, right? So what you want is, is that, that nose to filter out any debris or microorganisms that might be coming in. 
So this is the, the surface defenses right here. So mucus in your nose and hair. You have nose hairs right in the vestibule, right? And there's skin. So that is supposedly supposed to trap stuff before it gets to the place where, um, where it could cause infection. Now, in this particular diagram, which is from the new textbook, they have adaptive immunity, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but then they also talk about the internal defenses. So what happens when we get past those barriers, right? So we still have to have some innate mechanisms for fighting off infection once we get past the barriers. And so that's what this is referring to. Okay. So in your uh, book, they talk about, um, in your new textbook online, they talk about and they give you a table of all of the barriers. So you should be able to identify if it's a barrier and then maybe give me an example of a barrier um, if it was like a short answer question. Okay, so another mechanism of innate um, immunity is what is referred to as phagocytes. So phage means to eat. And then site, whenever you see this word, this means a cell. So phagocytes are the cells that eat microbes. And so they can detect them without ever knowing that or have, without ever experiencing them the, before. And the most common phagocytes that you have um, in your body is what is referred to as a neutrophil. So this is the most common white blood cell, which is a phagocyte. Now, the problem with neutrophils is, is that they can only eat so many bacteria before they die. And when they die, then they rupture. So they eat the bacteria, they take it in, they digest it, but then they rupture. And that is actually what uh, part of what produces pus. So pus is actually just dead neutrophils. Um, so you know that there has been an infection that you have been fighting off, right? So they eat bacteria and other debris. So it could be like cellular debris. Then they die, rupture, and produce pus. So the cool thing about the neutrophils is that they can actually detect a bacteria and then they can go in and they can actually hunt it down. And so let's see if I can find my video on this. Neutrophil. Okay, so this is actually in blood. And so what you're seeing here is, is this is, would be like red blood cells. This is my white blood cell. White blood cells tend to be bigger. And then you probably, or you might know that bacteria are also cells. They have antigens on the surface of them, but they're just a lot smaller. So they are, are called prokaryotic cells and they're much smaller than our eukaryotic cells. Neutrophils are white blood cells that hunt and kill bacteria. In this spread, so a neutrophil is take the volume up a red bit. blood cells. Oh. Staphylococcus aureus bacteria have been added. The small clump of bacteria release a chemoattractant that is sensed by the neutrophil. The neutrophil becomes polarized and starts chasing the bacteria. The bacteria, bounced around by thermal energy, move in a random path seeming to avoid their predator. Eventually, the neutrophil catches up with the bacteria and engulfs them by phagocytosis. I don't think they make that sound. I think they added that. <laughs> so it takes it inside. So phagocytosis is where it just engulfs it. It would take it inside and then it internally digests it, right? And so we'll talk more, a lot more about phagoc phagocytosis and how some cells actually digest it and say pieces of it to be presented to the immune system for further processing. So another example of a phagocyte that is really important is called a macrophage. 
And so these are much larger than the neutrophils, hence the macro. So they're large phagocytic cells. And they actually have a different strategy. Rather than engulfing, they actually lasso. So they actually have these cytoplasmic extensions that they extend out and then they wrap it around the bacteria and then they bring it in. So I'll just put they, that they lasso, oops, how do you spell lasso? Two S's, I think. Lasso bacteria with cytoplasmic extensions. And they draw it into the inside to digest. And they don't die. So when we look at neutrophils, neutrophils are found in the blood. There's a lot of them in the blood. But the macrophages also take up residence in different parts. So like we talked about the lymph nodes, there would be macrophages within those lymph nodes. There's macrophages within your spleen that would eat dead and um, old red blood cells. There's also macrophages in your lungs. So if you get bacteria way down deep in your lungs, these macrophages are what are going to eat that debris to protect the, your respiratory surface from infection and kind of get rid of the debris so that you can get oxygen moving through the membrane. So these macrophages are really important. And um, I don't have a video of them today, but we're going to watch a video in lab that shows the significance of the macrophage. So they are important. The monocytes, you don't really need to know, but they are the precursors of macrophages. So they're just the leukocyte that then become specialized to become a macrophage. Now there's another type of cells besides the phagocytes, and these are called natural killer cells. So these sometimes are abbreviated. You see them abbreviated as NK cells. NK cells. So when you think about this word natural killer, you can kind of think innate, right? So this is still part of the innate immune system. So this is, you want to be careful, this is not killer T cells, which we'll talk about in a little bit, because T cells are part of the adaptive response, okay? So these are not phagocytes. So they are actually really important in um, an immune response and people that do not have natural killer cells for like, for example, they've inherited an autoimmunity disease or um, excuse me, um, immunodeficiency disease have problems if they don't have the natural killer cells. So these can detect cells that are cancerous or with or have a virus. So I'll just get, put can cause cancerous cells or infected cells to die. Now when a cell undergoes this death, sometimes it's referred to as apoptosis. So I'll put ap, oh, this might be a word that you remember from cell biology, because it's kind of the opposite of mitosis, which is cell division. So apoptosis is cell death. So rather than eating the cancer cells or the virally infected cells, it just causes those cells to die. Okay. So they are different from the phagocytes. Okay, so we also have chemicals in our body that can send signals and they are part of the innate immune system. So we have what are called cytokines. And these are chemical signals between leukocytes. So like between neutrophages or neutrophils or macrophages. Okay, it's chemical signals. 
So these cytokines can cause cells to change their physiology, change what they're doing. So it can also um, cause um, uh, chemicals to be released into solution and cause changes in the tissue itself. So we can talk about a, a type of chemical signal, which is called histamine. And you have heard of histamine before because when we take antihistamines, what we're trying to do is get rid of the action of histamine because histamines are released by specialized cells called mast cells. And they're released in response to like a cytokine being present. What the histamine does is it causes capillaries to become leaky. So fluid moves out of the capillaries and into the tissues. So if we have the capillaries, which are part of the circulatory system, and then we have the interstitial fluid. So interstitial means between the cells, between the cells of the tissue. So this is my interstitial fluid. So water moves out, but also important things like clotting factors move out. Right. Antibodies move out. We'll talk about what antibodies are in a little bit. Okay. Also, neutrophils can move out into the interstitial fluid. So everything that is leaked from the capillaries into my interstitial fluid is called exudate. So this is exudate. So think exude, you're exuding all of this fluid into your interstitial fluid. And this is actually going to lead to edemia, right? So leads to swelling or edema, sorry, edema, not edemia, which it leads to edemia or edema or swelling. Okay. Okay. So oftentimes we think swelling is bad, right? So let's say you hurt yourself, you twist your ankle and your ankle swells up, okay? Oftentimes swelling that is not long lasting is actually a good thing because what it's doing is it's letting uh, white blood cells and other things into that tissue to help repair it. So if you have internal bleeding, you want exudates to move out into the tissue because it's gonna to help to clot the blood and prevent more internal bleeding. It's also going to take white blood cells in there and start to clean up that debris. And so um, exudate is actually healing, but the problem becomes when you have um, chronic swelling. So if you have chronic edema, chronic tissue swelling, then it can be a bad thing because those immune systems can become overreactive and it could cause damage to the, to the tissue. So we want the inflammation, which we'll talk about in a second, to happen, but we don't want it to be chronic inflammation. Are there any questions about that idea? So oftentimes you elevate uh, appendage when it's swollen and you also ice it, right, to take the swelling down. But sometimes that temporary swelling can be a good thing. If it's too much, though, it can be very painful as well. We also have what are called chemokines. And these are, are chemical um, attracted. So these are chemicals that are released that attract leukocytes to a particular area. 
so chemokines. The other example of a chemical uh, that is found in the blood that is really important are what are referred to as, so this would be still under chemicals. This is complement proteins. So complement proteins. We don't know a, a lot about the complement proteins, but we know there's a lot of them in the blood. So there's believed to be like maybe 50 different kinds in the body and they're found in the blood specifically. And what these complement proteins do is they complement the immune system so they can actually cause um, cells to be destroyed by the immune system. So they can bind to foreign antigens. And this binding to foreign antigens actually has a name and it's called opsonization. Opsonization. That's an S, opsonization. And so notice that they just have them numbered as complement protein number one, number two, number four, number three, right? So there's a lot of them that interact with one another. So the only thing that you need to know here is, is that these complement proteins are binding to an antigen and they're actually signaling, they're gonna actually bind to this antigen that's on the surface of this pathogen in green, right? And they're eventually going to lead to their destruction. And one way that they lead to their destruction is by creating holes in the pathogen. So I'll put can create holes in the pathogen. In this case, it's a bacteria. Right? And then the pathogen ruptures because it is no longer able to maintain its outer membrane. So it's like a bullet. So they just insert themselves into the membrane and cause the uh, pathogen to uh, lysis, to undergo, to rupture. And so this is an example of all of these complement proteins working together to insert themselves into the pathogen and cause a, the response. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about inflammation. So we have acute inflammation, which is after an injury. This is defensive, right? So it's a good thing to have acute inflammation. Chronic inflammation can actually lead to disease. The so chronic means long term and lead to disease. So for example, um, uh, atherosclerosis, which is blocking of major arteries that give rise to heart, attack, heart attacks, now believe, they believe that chronic inflammation may play a role in that. If certain bacteria get into our blood vessels and cause chronic inflammation, it can actually cause uh, cholesterol to be, be deposited in the major blood vessels. And then that those blood vessels can rupture or they can become blocked and you can get a heart attack, for example. So chronic inflammation is a bad thing, but acute inflammation is good. I had her as a student. <laughs> so I'm saying. Okay. So it is characterized by swelling, redness, Eat 
and pain. The swelling is due to um, histamine causing fluid to leave the circulatory system and go out into the tissues. We also have um, um, redness and heat, and this is due to what we call vasodilation. So vasodilation means that the blood vessels dilate and more blood will travel to the area of injury. So blood vessels increase in diameter or dilate. Let's put a little increase, a little arrow in diameter. And more blood travels to the area. Okay, that also brings with it heat because blood is coming from maybe closer to the center of the body out, right? And then we have pain. So damaged tissue releases chemical signals that cause pain. So damaged tissue releases, for example, bradykinin, that's B-R-D-Y-K-I-N-I-N, and you might have heard of prostaglandins, which are important in a, different, a lot of different ways, but they are also produced by all the tissues. And prostaglandins can be a source of pain. So these bind to pain receptors in the body, and they say, oh, you, your skin has been damaged, right? The ability to sense uh, pain decreases as you get older. So even now, like, I will, like, cut myself and I'll, like, bleed all over the place. And I'm like, I didn't even feel that, right? And so specifically older people have a problem in that they will, they don't even feel when they get a wound. Um, and so that becomes a problem with possible infections if they don't keep that area clean, right? So the sensation of pain is important just for you to protect your body. Um, we can take up things that reduce the release of prostaglandins. So for like aspirin and ibuprofen specifically. So these decrease prostaglandin production. And ibuprofen is prostaglandin an anti-inflammatory. Oops, I spelled that wrong. Glandin production. So this reduces pain, but also in the case of ibuprofen, aspirin is too, I think, decreases um, uh, swelling. Okay, um, so in the process of inflammation, the neutrophils are actually able to move out into the tissue and um, um, and start to eat the bacteria. So this is just showing the movement of chemical signals into the fluid so that histamine is released when the tissue is damaged. And then neutrophils, which are shown here having the kind of this funky nucleus, um, squeeze out of the capillaries and enter with the blood into the tissue. So the, the fluid moving into the tissue helps to kind of wash, flush the wound out, but also that we have these phagocytes that enter into the tissue and then will eat the bacteria. And then macrophages will also be attracted to this um, site of injury because of those um, chemical signals that, were, that will attract more white blood um, cells to that particular injury. Okay. So here you can see clotting begins right, with those clotting uh, proteins that come out of the blood. So it helps to create a network so that you don't lose excessive amounts of blood. And I think we talked about when we were talking about the skin, we talked about the formation of the scab and the new granulation tissue, which is a regenerative tissue that's going to repair that damage. So the last part of the phago of the, of the inflammatory response 
is, is that phagocytes they go into the tissue and digest the bacteria. They also, you know, will also clean up cellular debris. So the dead and damaged cells that are left there in the site of injury will also be repaired. So it's kind of interesting. You can have this inflam inflammatory response in different parts of your body. So like I have a herniated disc in my back. And so what that is, is, is that there's a little push me pad between the vertebrae and it has bulged out into my spinal column and is pressing on spinal nerves. And so I get periods of time where I have inflammation back there. And my doctor told me that the inflammation is actually a good thing because over time, what you would hope would happen is, is that white blood cells, specifically macrophages, are gonna go into that site of injury that is internal and is going to eat up all of that, all of that debris. So it's gonna eat that disc. And so over time, we're hoping the disc will just shrink, right? So sometimes it causes inflammation that is so painful that then I ask for shots like cortisone or prednisone, right? And that decreases the inflammation and that reduces pain. But that is also going to, um, if I'm constantly getting cortisone shots in my knees and in my back or wherever I'm feeling inflammation, that is going to over time decrease the ability of the immune system to just naturally take care of the damage in the body. So you'd hope that, you know, that's years like five years, maybe my, you know, herniated disc will shrink up to the point where it no longer causes problems. Okay, so are there any idea or any questions about the idea of inflammation caused by external injuries or internal injuries? We'll talk more about inflammation of the digestive tract because that is, seems to be a big problem um, recently with people developing celiac and Crohn's disease specifically. Okay. So, oops, another defense mechanism is what is referred to as fever. Okay. So I'm gonna put that this is a defense mechanism, which means that if we did not have fever, then the bacteria or what other pathogen, the virus, would be better able to survive and reproduce, right? So it's not that they're causing, the bacteria and the viruses are causing the fever, but however, it is a good thing because it actually decreases their ability to survive. And so we have white blood cells, um, leukocytes is the general name for them. The leukocytes release pyrogens. So pyro means fire, gen means generator. So this is fire generating molecules. So does anybody remember what part of the brain regulates your body temperature? Hypothalamus, okay. So these travel to the hypothalamus. And this is the control center for a lot of different things, but one of the things that it controls is body temperature. And so they alter, it alters the set point for the body temperature. They'll put body temperature set point. So in terms of homeostasis, your body is trying to maintain a relative constant temperature but if the set point goes from 98.6 to 102, then your body's going to try to get back to 102 because that's the set point. So let's put like maybe 102 degrees, right? And that's Fahrenheit. So one of the interesting things about fever is the onset is very interesting because you actually feel cold. Oops, feel cold. 
and you shiver. Why do you think you shiver? Produce more body heat, right? So your skeletal muscles, when they contract, they produce heat, and so you'll shiver. So if you've ever had a really bad fever, like I had a kidney infection, and that was like the worst fever I've ever had, because I literally was laying in bed with every blanket I had on, and I could not stop shaking, right? Like teeth rattling, shaking. So my body was trying to get my body temp, my hypothalamus was trying to get my body temperature up so I could fight the bacterial infection that was in my kidney, right? And that's a really uh, hard one to treat. So you have to, I think I ended up going to the hospital on that one. But um, so you start to shiver, okay? So then once you get to the, the set point, then you feel okay, right? So you're laying in your bed and you feel, even though you're 102, you do not feel hot. You feel just kind of normal. Although it can also make you achy, right? So that the elevated temperature also has an effect on how you feel, okay? So when a fever breaks, the set point goes back to normal. So your body temperature could still be 102, but your set point goes back to normal. So what do you feel? You would feel hot, right? So this is when you like take off all the covers. Uh, like now I'm hot, right? And you would sweat. So sweating is a sign that the fever has broken, right? And you're going back to normal. Your set point has gone back to normal. Now, there are some instances where the body temperature gets above a certain point where it can be bad, right? Really detrimental. And this is a, a, a big problem with babies because oftentimes we put them in their pajamas, their fleece pajamas, and they can't sweat to kind of moderate their temperature. And then we might wrap them in blankets. And so they have a hard time, time getting rid of the heat. And so if this temperature gets above, generally above 104 degrees Fahrenheit, this is the safe, what they call the safe limit. So some babies will get to like 105 degrees. And then what typically happens then is, is they start to seizure. And that can be really, really scary. And if you call your doctor, um, what they tell you to do is to put your baby in a lukewarm bath because they're able to get rid of the heat much more quickly when they're exposed to water than when you're exposed to air. You're gonna lose heat much more quickly to water than to air, right? And so you don't want to get to the point where the um, individual is seizuring because their body temperature has gotten too hot, okay? That's also a big problem in people when they decide they wanna lose weight and they wear black sweats and they're running around the track on a 100 degrees day, right? Their body temperature can get too hot because they're not sweating. And so they can have um, hyperthermia where their body temperature gets too hot and they can pass out and go into a coma. Okay, is there anything anybody else wants to add to, to this conversation about fevers? So they have shown that if you can um, avoid taking, which is really hard for me even, um, Tylenol or fever reducing drugs, for example, you tend to get over your illness more quickly. Right? But who wants to be laying around in bed with a 102 degree fever because you feel <laughs> awful, right? Also it prevents you from getting up and going to school and spreading the disease or the, the pathogen to your, to your uh, fellow classmates, right? Okay. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna start talking about adaptive defenses today. So these require previous exposure. to pathogen, for example, to a bacteria, to a virus, right? So sometimes this is referred to as learned, 
And the reason why it is learned is because in response to being subjected to a pathogen, you develop memory cells. So the development of memory cells that, oops, that survive for long periods of time. It's kind of interesting because sometimes it could be your entire life, right? So generally, like if you get chicken pox, you're going to have those memory cells in your body a long time. And so if that chicken pox gets, if you touch a baby with chicken pox, you're not going to get it because your memory cells are going to be able to respond quickly enough to cause um, a, um, a reaction that will prevent you from getting infected, right? Sometimes those memory cells don't last long enough. So for example, you can get vaccinated for the tetanus, which is actually a, a toxin that's produced, a neurotoxin that's produced by bacteria, but you have to get re-vaccinated, right? So they say, what, every 10 or 11 years, you have to get re-vaccinated for tetanus. And so they don't live for your entire lifespan. You get more susceptible the longer it is. Okay. These involve what are referred to as T and B lymphocytes. So sometimes these are called T cells. And remember, where do T, why are they called T cells? Where do they mature? Thymus. And B cells, where do they mature? Bone marrow. Okay. So these are not the neutrophils. The neutro this is a type of leukocyte, but it's not neutrophils. It's not macrophages. These are specific types of cells that are only, well, actually they coordinate with in, innate, but they are, they are the, our adaptive defenses. Okay. So in order to, um, to be able to um, have an adaptive defense, we have to be able to recognize specific antigens, right? So these are able to recognize specific antigens. And I'll put antibody generating molecules. Okay. So just think antigen. Anti is short for antibody. And then gen just means to produce, so to generate molecules. And so these antigens could be um, uh, proteins on the surface of cells. So antigens could be proteins on the surface of cells. Right. They could also be... Um, toxins that are released from pathogens. So for example, if you get um, a bacterial infection like tetanus and it releases those toxins, then your body will produce antibodies in response to those antigens. We also have venoms. So if you think about a snake bite, right, or a bite from a spider, we actually have the ability to produce antibodies in response to those venoms, and they will hopefully go in, right, and um, and detoxify them, right? So they cannot do harm, right? So sometimes if you get bit by a rattlesnake, for example, you want to go in and get an anti-venom. And what the anti-venom is, is antibodies. So they give you antibodies that bind to the venom and um, neutralize it so it cannot cause problems. Like if it's a neurotoxin and it's gonna be toxic to the nervous system, it shuts it down. So these are some things that the lymphocytes, um, what they are able to detect, those antigens. Okay? Another thing are allergens. 
So allergens also cause the production of antibodies, specific types of antibodies that are associated with allergies. So this could be like pollen, right? Pollen would have proteins on its surface that are completely different from the proteins that are in our body. And then it could also be things like um, food allergies, like peanut allergies or gluten allergies. You could produce antibodies in response to that. Okay. So being subjected to those can sometimes lead to allergic responses. Okay, so this is just an example of the antigen, right? What an antigen is. And so this is from your new textbook. So here we have a protein. So let's say that this is a protein that is, has been produced by a bacteria, right? And there's specific parts of that protein that the um, T cells can bind to. And so those specific parts are what the T cell is gonna respond to. And so this protein is gonna be, an, is gonna be um, detected and there is going to be a response initiated against it. So we're going to talk about T cells, and the T cells are actually classified based upon the types of receptors that they have on their surface of the cell. So um, we'll just put classified according to receptor proteins on their surface. So the first classification are what are referred to as CD4 cells. So CD4 is the receptor. So that's just the name for the receptor, CD4. So CD4 cells include what are called helper T cells. And you might have heard of helper T cells previously because this is what the HIV virus attacks and utilizes for reproduction. And actually they can attack the CD4 or the helper T cells because they gain entry through by binding to that CD4 protein. So that's probably how we first discovered that there was two different types of T cells. Um, so the, CD, the helper T cells um, help to um, coordinate the immune response. So help to coordinate immune response. So for example, um, they would, might send a signal, a, a chemical signal like a cytokine to B cells, causing the B cells to undergo cell division. Okay, so they, they communicate with each other by releasing cytokines. Okay. The other type of T cell that's a CD4 are called regulator T cells or regulation T cells. And these help to suppress the immune response. So it's really important that the immune response does not get carried away. It does get carried away in the case of a lot of allergies, right, where it causes this excessive swelling so people can't even breathe, for example, and then they die of a massive allergy attack. So these regulator T cells help to regulate, to suppress the immune response. Okay. And then we have the CD8 cells. And the CD8 cells are the cytotoxic T cells. Cytotoxic T cells. And these um, cytotoxic are sometimes referred to as killer T cells. So I'll put killer, but notice that they do not have the word natural in front of them. So natural, or natural killer cells are innate, killer T cells are adaptive, right? So these have an abbreviation like 
TH. So when you see TH, that means that it's the helper T cell. When you see TR, that means it's the regulator T cell. When you see TC, that means it's the cytotoxic T cells. So these are, are actually the cells that are capable of attacking other cells and causing them to die. And so we'll just put that they attack cells by releasing chemicals. And the chemicals are called perforins. And so if you look at this word, perforin means to perforate. So it means to put holes in something. So it puts a hole in a bacteria or a cancer cell, for example. And um, so this creates a hole. So put that in parentheses. And granzymes. So anytime you see zyme, what do you think? enzyme. So these are enzymes that are going to digest the cell from the inside out. So these granzymes go into the inside of the cell and digest it. So I'll just put digest cell from the inside out. So those are granzymes. So the T cells mature in the thymus. And it is really important, that period of maturation, because we, we do not want to produce T cells that are going to attack normal, healthy tissue. And so there is a mechanism by which our bodies can ensure that these T cells that might potentially be bad are screened out. Okay? So we can talk about... Um, the screening out by looking at what are called MHC proteins. Okay, so MHC proteins is abbreviation for major histocompatibility proteins. So histo means tissue. Compatibility means, is it going to be attacked by the immune system? So when they're trying to figure out whether or not a person is a good donor, they look to see what their MHC proteins are. So my MHC proteins are different from your MHC proteins. So these are found on all cells, right? So they're used for recognition, right? So they're recognition proteins. Interesting aside about these MHC proteins is a while ago they discovered that the pheromones that you release, these hormonal signals that you release to perhaps attract a mate, um, differ depending upon your MHC proteins and that if you have MHC proteins similar to a potential mate, um, you can detect that unconsciously and you will not tend to be attracted to them. So it kind of serves, they think, as a, a protection against inbreeding. So you're not going to want to mate with a person that has similar MHC proteins that you do. You're going to prefer to mate with somebody who is who is immunologically different than you are, right? So you're going to the the strange male um, hypothesis that females are attracted to males that are different, that are coming from the outside and might have different immune system properties than um, than they do. Okay, and that makes their offspring actually more immunologically diverse as well. Okay, so these are the MHC proteins, and the T cells use them to recognize other cells. 
want to talk about that. I want to talk about T cell differentiation first. Okay. The last thing we'll talk about is this differentiation. So T cells are derived from stem cells in the bone marrow. So I'm going to put stem cells in the bone marrow. Here, I'm going to draw a little diagram. Some of those cells can become T cells. Some of them can become B cells. In the case of the B cells, they mature in the, um, in the um, bone marrow, but the T cells mature in the thymus gland. So when they first come into the thymus gland, um, they're in the outer part of the thymus gland, and they're given an MHC protein. They're kind of subjected, the, the thyroid or the thymus gland has cells that present um, the MHC protein. So the first thing that happens is um, thymus cells present MHC protein to the T cells. Okay. Now, if that T cell does not recognize the MHC protein, then it is destroyed, right? So it dies, okay? So we'll put um, recognizes, and then it can move into step two. Okay. This is step two does not recognize we'll put that it is destroyed right so what this means is is that you could produce t cells that would not recognize your own cells and that would be a bad thing right because if it doesn't recognize your cells it's going it could potentially see it as foreign and they could attack it and then you would get an immuno autoimmune disease that could be bad so then this is what is referred to as positive selection. You know, I was thinking natural selection might play this role. Yeah, yeah. So positive, oh, you can't see that word. Positive just means, in this case, positive means that it can recognize, so it's a positive selection, right? The other thing that happens when it gets moves down into the thymus gland is it is presented with or presented with the MHC protein by a another cell. So this could be like a macrophage. So the macrophage is a cell that presents antigens to a T cell. So if the macrophage is saying, here, look at this, are you going to attack it or are you not going to attack it? And if it does attack it, then that would also be a bad thing, right? So the next part of this is actually negative um, selection. So if it attacks the cell, Right? then it is destroyed. If it does not attack cell, then it is passed out of the thymus gland. So this is an example of negative selection. Okay. So we want it to be able to recognize the MHC protein, but we don't want it to actually um, cause a response. And so we negatively select against those that do respond to it. So this is what is referred to as the higher education of the T cells in the thymus gland. So the thymus 
cells, the T cells, have to go to the thymus gland to get this education, right, to, to be screened against possible damaging effects that they may have. And we produce, our thymus gland when we're born is huge. It's like even kind of extends down to over the heart. And so when we look at the fetal pig, you'll see that the thymus gland is very big because we're having to produce a lot of T cells when we were young because we're exposed to all this new stuff, right? But then when you go to dissecting a cadaver, you can't even find the thymus gland because as, we, as soon as we become adolescent and adults, the thymus gland starts to shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink and pretty soon it is so small that you can't even find it, right? So the thymus gland is huge and, and so this is really important. This education of the T cells is really important um, specifically in children. So if we look at a diagram that shows these, okay. So this is my um, T, this is my T cell, right? And I'm saying here that it's going to recognize the MHC. So it has re and this has a lot more information than you need to know, but it recognizes the MHC, so it is selected. If it does not bind to the MHC, then it is destroyed, right? So this is in your, the new online textbook. The second part here is, does it cause a response? And so here, a, this would be like a macrophage. We didn't talk about dendritic cells, but similar to a macrophage. They're presenting the MHC protein. And if it um, binds to the self antigen, then it is, um, see, if it does not bind to the antigen, then it is kept. If it does bind to the self antigen, then it is destroyed, right? So we select for T cells that can tell self that don't respond to self. Okay. So that's um, the higher education of the T cells in your thymus gland. Okay, so we'll stop there for today, and then we are going to um, have a lab on Friday. So make sure that you bring um, a lab spiral, probably a three ring binder, not a spiral, a three ring binder for your lab notes. And uh, that is downstairs in ST 119 at 10 o'clock. Okay. So I might have to leave the lab. Okay. So hopefully. Hopefully not. Okay. But okay. We'll okay. See. I know. I understand.